and Dr. Wilson is with us. She is a dentist. And I keep wishing to myself that Portmore would invite her to come and set up a little thing over here at the prep school um, and heavily discounted, but Portmore hasn't invited her yet. I hopefully they will take me up on the offer. I think the mic is a little bit soft. And I'm older now, I need all the help I can get. I saw Pastor Cahoon a week ago Saturday at a funeral service in Montego Bay. And he remarked at how surprised he was that I was there at the burial and I was there at the end of the repast. For he said he has never seen me stay anywhere that long. And I told him that that was because I was transporting Reverend Sam Green and Reverend Peter Spencer and couldn't jolly well leave them behind. <laughs> However, the reason I'm leaving this time is because your invitation came after my responsibility to participate in the JTS dedication service, which is at 10.30 at Grace, was already established. But I promised myself that by the time your next invitation comes in 2018 or late 2017, I will make sure and stay for the brunch at that time, God willing. God willing. Willie. Thank Miss Arnold, is it, for reading the passage so well, so I won't have to read for the whole of it myself. And thank you very much for giving me an hour in which to speak. I hear that Spencer has kept the tradition of an hour preaching <laughs> alive and well. <laughs> A reading from the book of Ephesians. Chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, but train them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let us pray. Open mine eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Help me to listen, to reach out and touch him, to tell him I love him. Open mine eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My choice of text has been determined by the invitation to share in a ceremony both to honor a distinguished servant of the Lord, Sister Cynthia Williams, and to mark the Founders' Day of the Portmore Missionary Prep and Kindergarten. And I was very conscious of a challenge that face us together, not just as a church and school, but as a people and nation of 
preparing a generation to overcome the challenges that are now being faced by our society. That task of preparing a generation to be leaders, to be citizens, to be workers, to be families, is necessary because any serious analysis of the society in which we live will lead us to despair. There is a sense that some of us have that our society is on the edge, is at the brink, is about to self-destruct. And we believe that were we to be equal to the task of preparing a generation, that we could come up with leaders, with citizens, with workers, with family members who could turn things around profoundly. So I have come to this verse which will frame our reflection together this morning. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, but train them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We must note two things in passing about the text. The first is where the text is in the book of Ephesians. The text is sandwiched between two high watermarks in Paul's teachings. On the one side, is the watermark of Paul's teaching on the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Do not get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And in verse 10 of chapter 6, he says, put on the whole armor of God. And a text like our little text, finding itself between those two high watermarks, has something to tell us. It tells us that when you are full of the Spirit, and when you are donned or dressed with the armor of God, don't for one moment believe that it is automatic that you will be able to bring up your children properly. That even people who are full of the Spirit and people who have on the whole armor of God are severely tested when it comes to bringing up Dear children, in fact, bringing up children is a great leveler. Politicians fail at it. Teachers, with the greatest of respect, fail at it. Policemen fail at it. And as to us as persons, we are a favorite beating stick insofar as our legendary failure in the household is concerned. So locating this text where it is in the book of Ephesians requires and reminds us that there is a job of work to do that will not come easy. 
that will not come automatically. That will require shoulders to the wheel. That will require diligence, intention, and patience. If we are going to be good stewards of all our responsibility. Here it is. People who are full of the Spirit and people who are donned with the armor of God are still being told, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So that we understand at the very outset that there is a task to be performed even as good Christian people. And if it is a task even for those who are full of the Spirit, and those who are wearing the armor of God, I dare suggest that it is a task that humbles every one of us and challenges every one of us and is inescapable to all of us. We each one gathered here must be mindful of the project to bring up children in the right and proper way. But I am not talking to people and I'm not talking to you as parents alone. Because it seemed to me to be fair to the requirements of the tasks that all of us going to have to chip in. You know they used to say that the village raised a child and the partnership now broken between home, church, school, and community must be renewed because we face an emergency situation where our children are concerned. And I'm going to come back to make one or two points about the emergency situation we face. Suffice to say here, though, that we are talking about a project an undertaking, a mission, a task, which is going to require the best of the best of us to perform it. So one comment relates to where the text is. The second comment relates to to whom is the text addressed. It says fathers. Now, lest you are inclined, like some of the translators, to render the word parents, I must show you that in the verse above, it differentiates between mother and father. It says in the verse above, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And then it says, fathers. So the fact that it differentiates above the two sides of parenting, mother and father, must mean that it intends for us to take the word in this particular injunction, fathers, seriously. And I need to say that because if one listens to the narrative and the conversation, you would think that fathering, meaning the one performed by the male of the species, is an optional extra that we can succeed somehow in the project of preparing a generation with men invisible and absent. It is not the view of this text. 
This text believes that fathers have a central and important role to play. And it does not intend to give a blight to any lazy man. Any man who wants to take the, take the easy way out, go run up and down and pretend that him losing the edge paper, running down like a girl here and running down like a girl there. This text believes that you have a fundamental role to play. It's not a concession because your wife couldn't come or your girlfriend for that matter. You have a duty and I have a duty and we have a duty to do something about the immense damage being done to the image of maleness in the society. We are never going to fly that bird on one wing. When it comes to rescuing and preparing a generation, we have first to spend some time dealing with the damage psychologically, emotionally, and otherwise of the masculine gender. This text believes that the man has an important role to play. And I'm going to say a word, and I'm saying it early so I'll have time to recover in the sermon. Listen to me, women. You're good, but God never make it for you and do it. There are too many women who are comfortable excluding the men from the lives of their children. We have to work harder at it. Now, I am not for one moment letting off the men. I am not letting them off though. But indeed, all I am saying is that the project that is ahead of us, and it is a considerable project. It is an urgent project. It is a vital project. It is a, vi as a project that this country will not soon recover if we do not fix. It's going to require all hands on deck. And for the moment, I am saying, especially the man them. God, they are the problem. They are the problem. And this text just wants to address, yes, it is speaking in a time when men were expected to be the leaders in moral and spiritual formation in their home. And it is pointing to that at that time, they carried out their role with too much enthusiasm. And that, that resulted in some things which the text is correcting. It is not saying that moral and spiritual formation is a male responsibility alone. It is not saying that. Nor is it saying that if there is no male, moral and spiritual formation cannot take place. But what it is saying is that the project before us is going to require a fix, especially in an environment in which men are thought to be sperm donors, stop at that. We must begin to reassert and reclaim and perform a role self-consciously and deliberately in the preparing of a generation. We walk in the community nowadays, you drive, you see the men them with their daughters walking and proud of them. When they are like a little baby, after that now you can't find them. We feel that that is a central role. Look, Sister Williams, you are, I don't know if you are retired or just retiring. But listen, we can't afford anybody to be in the lap of leisure now. We, we really need everybody. All the brains, all the experience. Let me, let me tell you three things I see. I see the problem of violence. I, I see the problem. And you like me read the stories. You know? First murder committed in 2014 was of a 13-year-old stabbing a 14-year-old in Clarkstown. Not in some ghetto. In Clarkstown. To death. 
what has happened is that we have a hot blood generation that cannot resolve the simplest dispute except by resorting to the ultimate weapon of violence. Everything that you are, you are taught on the television, I was watching Paul Walker's a, a reconstruction of Paul Walker's demise, the um, fast driving actor who died in a Porsche going 100 miles an hour, and they said there was no smut, soot in his lungs. That means he died instantly. He didn't even get to breathe in some of the smoke when the car burned up. And I thought to myself, after you watch enough movies, you come to believe that you are indestructible. And when you're watching of violence on television, you feel that the victims of violence can just change them clothes tomorrow and the violence disappear. Violence has become second nature, and part of the project is to take us away from this love of violence. All of us, in our language, it is part of the project to rescue a generation from the idea that violence is the ultimate solution. It is not. It is crosses. It is curse. And it, it has done immense damage on the society. And there is a project, there is a project to construct in the minds of our young people a peacefulness, a love of peace, an ability to intervene for the sake of peace, to become peacemakers. I think that's part of the project. I'll tell you the other thing I see. And this is where, let me drink some water for it. Let me, let me not put it this way. Nowadays, our body is like a canvas. We use it to show things. So, so you know, if you want to mark up yourself, if you want to advertise a product or even your boyfriend, you just write it by you. <laughs> and then you write it so you can't rub it out. You know what happens if you broke up after that? You soon run out of space to write things. That by itself is innocent. But it is followed by a distortion of a sense of themselves. People no longer value themselves, you know. They know that they, they treat themselves as if their body is expendable, like they can get another one. They can order a remake like some iPad or something. They go to the store and take the old one and give you a new one. It, 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 so, so when you look at what people do with their hair and their face, well, I know I belong to the last generation. We're boring. Look at me. I'm boring. I come back. The only thing I talk me is to change my type. I don't have no lipstick. I don't think up all of my eyes. I mean, I understand. I, I confess. The problem is there is not a commensurate valuation of yourself. Everybody have a buy here from abroad. Let me leave that one quickly. One billion dollar word. The third thing I see. Is the option and choices being made in terms of our survival? And I was very conscious that I was coming to speak at a church that was very close to Back Road. Let me tell you something. Back Road is a scar on the skin of all our humanity. Those little girls, man. Huh? This is what they do. This is the best our country can offer our young people for survival. Well, if that were all, it would be bad and not bad enough. But think about the latter scam. Think of what has happened to a generation. Everybody wants consumer items, and for that, they will sell their souls and kill their mother. What do you think has happened? I'll tell you why I think we have ended life. We spend our time believing that bringing up a child is making them pass them subject. Bringing up a child 
is buy them anything they want. Bringing up a child is letting them do what they want. And what has happened to us is we have reaped the whirlwind. We have a generation without a sense of themselves, without inhibition, without knowing the ways of God. And that is the project to which I have come here to recruit you. I want to leave you with a challenge that you and me, you and I, are part of a project of preparing a generation, of deepening their moral sensibility, of increasing the value they place upon themselves, of teaching them the ways of God so that they may have a purpose and a meaning to their life and our every opportunity. Whether we, are get, we get paid for it or whether we volunteer, it is devoted intentionally to this project of making people ready to face the music that life is, to face the future, to be themselves, to give up their best and to make a difference in the world in which they find themselves. So let me make two main remarks and close with a third. How do we face the project, the undertaking which I have elicited your support to join? How? First of all, we have to face it with humility. We have to face it with humility, recognizing that when it comes to rearing children, to bringing up children in the right and proper way, when it comes to preparing a generation to be well-intentioned is not enough. But I make sure you understand me. When it comes to bringing up young people and children in the right and proper way. When it comes to laying the moral foundation on which their lives will be built. When it comes to preparing a generation to be well-intentioned is not enough. So let's reread what it says. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. So why does it say that? Why does it use that word? You know, there are, there are times when you're trying to discipline your children. When you want to stop your children from go street. When you're trying to make them understand what is right and make them shun what is wrong. That you come up with some measures. I don't know if they use it in Portmore, but when I was growing up, they were thing named a strap. You don't have that again. That they obsolete. That gone with the typewriter and so on. Subble jack them used to have and so on. Huh? Tamarind switch. And parents did this to their children because they were well-meaning. They were well-meaning, but what did it do? Did it make them more moral? We think they did. No, it embittered them. It made them angry. So this little thing reminds you that even in discipline, you can embitter your children, you can aggravate your children, you can make matters worse by being excessive. But you can also make matters worse by being too lax. That's right, that's right, that's right. And above all, you can make matters worse by being inconsistent. So when it comes to bringing up children, to be well-intentioned is not enough. You need to interact humbly with the contours of human development. I started out by saying that some of us who are well-placed and well, you would think, resourced in spiritual matters. 
still fail at bringing up our children. You ever heard about a thing called reverse effect? So you want your children to go to church and you make them go to church morning, noon, and night. And then you make sure that them not going to get mixed up so them don't go certain places. What happened the day when you can't tell them what to do? Them stop coming to church and them start going to places you didn't want them to go. Here's what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. When it comes to nurturing, deepening a moral consciousness, laying a foundation to be well-intentioned is not enough. You need more. You need God's help. You need the wisdom of God. And I, I, I will leave four rules. And I am saying it to you, remembering that I myself am struggling, a fellow struggler with you, but I'm not struggling with my children anymore. The only time I get to see them is like, oh, they visit me this morning. You know what I mean? So I don't have the, the, the project as immediately I'm relying on past blessings. The first rule is to be truthful. Listen to me. Your greatest instrument is the respect of your children. It is when they respect you because you live a true life. You're truthful. And they can see that in you. That begins to play a role as you seek to ground them morally and spiritually. Secondly, you have to be fear. And including being fear to their brothers and sisters. I think one of the toughest things for us to handle is bright children. You have one of them who does get all of them subject right. Pure ticky ticky when them come home. You have another one who nothing in my book. <laughs> uh, by the way, that's part of the problem that boys face, right? Women teachers do handle strong maleness in boys very well. You know, the more the more you are, kind of you you are a person that fit in. You know, and you'll be strong and so on. And you talk, you will talk back. Teacher run you out of class before you. I, it is a thing. I, I tell you, I, I can say so from personal experience. As you know, I was a regular person. You run out of class. If some of you could have your way, you know, you'd have run me out too. Yeah? <laughs> and then, so you have these two children. One of them do everything you say. And the other one, everything you said to them is a war. We don't handle that very well. But you have to learn to be fear. To be your favorites, you will look at the Bible and learn about a man named Jacob. He had a favorite son named Joseph and him destroy him house. Is Jacob, why those boys put Joseph in the pit and sell him as a slave? That's why. David was not so kosh after when him there around messing with Bathsheba. Him having problems in him house as soon as him finish him decide that him discover that Absalom take it over. You have to be fear. Beg God to get you fear to your neighbors, you know. Because the thing with children is that them see everything. So when you're running with that boy with them play marble with from next door. It undermines your ability. You know the teacher tell the boy to stand up. Sit down. Sit down, Jonathan. And Jonathan stand up. He says, sit down, Jonathan. Jonathan stand up. And she take out the bell. And Jonathan sit down. And he said, but I'm still standing up in my heart. (laughs) 
Be compassionate. Ask God to give you the grace to feel for others. You teach your children a lot if they see you as a person who is compassionate towards others. The needy first, but also the people you don't like. Be compassionate to them. And four, be patient. Remember what I'm saying to you. I am saying that in the nature of the project of laying a moral foundation to be well-intentioned is not enough. You can make profound mistakes. You can do immense damage, even though you mean good. So I am asking you to be true, to be fair, to be compassionate, and to be patient. Don't rush. Don't rush. A lot of children, some of them are sprinters, you know. In prep school, you have all kind of things to say about them. But the others might come through in high school, and some of them don't come till high school over. Some of them never come. But then what are you going to do? They don't have fear already. You know, have to stay with them. Have to stay with them. Maybe all you know is them have a cargo hospital when you're old, can they not leave the house? So one, be humble, ask God's help. Parenting is a lifelong project. The socialization, moral formation, moral armament, moral development of a generation is something that requires all of us doing it full time. Our weapons in that process is our truthfulness, the authenticity of our lives. Our weapons in that process is our fairness, a sense of justice which comes from God. Our weapons in that process is the compassion, the overflow of our heart. Let your children see you doing good for others. That will send them on their course for good. And the patience, yes, they're going to fail. Yes, they're going to fall. Don't give up on them. Don't cost them and tell them, I saw them poop a stay. You know about one of them included mud. No, you tell them. You keep true with them. Be patient. The second point that I want to make. The first is that you have to be humble. The second is that you have to be deliberate. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody get up early and go buy the newspaper. And they buy the newspaper and they start from the back. They go to the classified and they start marking out. They're looking for a place to rent or to buy. And them, otherwise they don't see cleaner man, you know. But because they're going to buy our bill of house, them start to mark it down. When it comes to having children, we have come up with a culture that is our kind of biological process alone. We just go until it comes, and then when it comes, we think about it. I don't think it can work like that. That's why the Bible gave marriage and put it as such a central element in the thing. And that's why he could still talk about fathers. Because it is in the marriage relationship that the fathers, not that it, it make them, you know. Because we have a whole heap of reversal to go on with. So a lady, recently I went to a church to preach and she came up and said, you don't remember me? And I said, yeah man, I remember your face, which is my nice line now. And she said, she told me who she was. And she said, you perform a wedding. And I said, okay, okay, long time ago. She said, long, long time ago. So I said, so, so how's your husband? She said, him? Me dash him a long time. I think I want to solicit you. 
I want to win you over to the idea that this is no easy undertaking. You remember where I placed it? Between being full of the Holy Spirit and putting on the whole armor of God. It's something on par with those in their importance, in its importance. Put it as front and center. God has given me the opportunity. Whether I got them from a children's home or I carried them back from the hospital, it don't matter. Whether it is a job that I take up at Portmore Missionary Prep or as a Sunday school that nobody pay me for, it don't matter. This is something which requires an intentionality from you. You have to think about it just like how people buy the classical ad and go and look and drive go people place, go knock them up and go look for room. Same way you have to take an interest in the nurturing of children. I am saying that the, uh, the, there are a couple of issues which are left over from slavery. One of them is the land question. In this country, land is sugar lands. They're all the best land. Sometimes you go out there and look on it, you say, what a wonderful thing if that was your front land or it's flat. Right? And we still have to resolve the land question. So I believe Portmore should be built more towards Bernard Lunch. We rather than you have this gravel thing where you can't grow anything too much on it. You have to get land is so, so fertile when you stand up on it, you grow. You know, but <laughs> But the other issue which is a leftover from slavery, is parenting. You, you know, and when I was writing, I wasn't sure Shani was going to be here, but she did her study on the 1920s. And she used to talk to me about these things as if I knew what I was learning. That up to the 1920s, children were not thought of as persons, you know, but as extension of property. And we haven't quite come to that realization yet. Where this is a whole life investment. Invest yourself in your children, but don't make them selfish. By thinking that they own you. And you can do nothing else but respond to their cry and their bidding. But what this is, is a project that requires full-time, whole life, quote, total resource commitment. A deliberate project. If you ask me, you don't, but I'm telling you anyway. There are four things I think we want to achieve in our children. And I'm talking not, not, not about their subjects. I, I'm not poo-eyeing external achievement. But let me tell you something. Sometimes it's overrated. Now, I'm not giving you an excuse not to, to fail, you know. But don't think that the end of your life is a certificate on the wall. No, please, please. I, I think it's what you are on the inside that make you the man. Four things. The first project is to teach by your example and by your precept. By the construct of your home and of your life. Teach your children to be thankful. Teach them to be thankful and to be grateful. If you produce a grateful human being, it will go a long way in forestalling some of the miserableness you see in the society. Teach them to be grateful. Teach them to be grateful to God. To learn, teach them to be grateful to you as their parents. No, no, go back and sing that song for the nine months I carried you. You don't have to do that. Come in, don't have an equivalent to sing. But you teach them to be grateful. Teach them to be grateful to history. You know, I went to the country, to my father's country the other day. And um, I was talking to one of my, I think I can call her my niece. She was my cousin's child. And I was encouraging her to apply. And to the seminary. And the child just went on her phone and called up the seminary and read the whole thing. 
And if you don't mind, download the application. Just right there. So in the country, you don't know where Wooster is, you know. But trust me, beyond is just beyond. You know, there's a back of beyond is up there, sir. <laughs> but no, she have access. No, she have access. The world has shrunken in the experience of our children. But they're not grateful. They're complaining more than you used to complain when you used to walk barefoot to school. Well, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. No, you, you walk barefoot. I live in Portmore for heaven's sake. Barefoot. So teach your children to be thankful. I was sharing last week. I can't remember if I get it wrong. Is because of the age, but I think I was sharing last week elsewhere that David said, Is there anyone left of the household of Saul to whom I can show the kindness of the Lord? Teach your children to be thankful. That's a first project. Teach them. To dream and to imagine. Teach them to dream and to imagine. My sister came from Florida. She wants to adopt a child. She doesn't have any children and she's in her 50s now. And she came to look to see if there was a child she could adopt. And so I had a, arranged a retinue of, of home, children's homes and the like that we would visit and then she would pick. I had my own idea as to which one she should pick, but you know, I, I said I will let her do the picking. Of course, I took her to one home on Monday and she was sure she found a child. Took her to another home and choose and she was sure she found a child. And I took her to another home and choose and she was sure she found two children that she wants. If I kept it up on Thursday, she'd have probably tell the whole population. <laughs> but when we went to the house on the Monday, I didn't know which one it was. She took some picture of the whole her children, you can't take one, you know, and then she said the one she wanted was the one that was sitting downside, downstairs looking outside. She said her interpretation is that that child didn't want to be there. She wanted the life that was beyond the fence. And she was imagining that world. And why she wanted that one, she said, is because she think she could give her the world beyond the fence. Teach your children not to do what others have done, but to think of what has not been done and say, why not? Open their imagination. Listen to me now. If you are going to teach them that, you have to spend some time making them read. Instead of carrying them to Burger King, and I walk with a gentleman who owns Burger King, on a morning, so please don't tell him that I said that. <laughs> Drive them to your country. In fact, take the bus. Let them see the country. Instead of sending them to America, make them go lock up in a some house, and then when your cousin come home and carry them to the mall, you make them see the world. Take them to museums. Build their capacity to imagine. Build their capacity to imagine. What's the third thing? Uh, they gave me a certain time. I have to leave by a certain time. So when you invite me back in 2017, I'll slow down on some of the parts. Right? <laughs> Teach them to work hard. And put it differently, not to despise hard work. 
I must have told, I told this church, but the congregation is entirely different except for a few people who are here. Well, a lot, but a lot of you I have never seen before. I used to tell them when I used to come here that when Hurricane Gilbert blew, that is in 1988, a hurricane blew in Jamaica. Some of you weren't around that time. And it mashed up the country. And I invited a friend down. It was really a mistake why I invited him. His, um, his letterhead said, Carpen, the carpenter's son. And I don't read it quick carefully. I thought it said the carpenter and son. So when the, he of course was referring to Jesus, but I thought he was saying he was a carpenter. So I invited him to Jamaica to help us because we had so many roof loss and so on. <laughs> I'm glad he's so sharp. And when he was here, he, after he came with a team anyway of construction people and did a lot of work, a lot of work. And then he was nearing the end of his time. He said to me, you know you lied to me. You told me that this was a classless society. Jamaica is not a society stratified in social classes. And it's not true. He said, your society is the worst class society there is. Because in your society... Work has a social class. Work has a social. If you work outside, I mean your job is outside, you know, in an office, your children tend to believe, you know, no good work. I'm embarrassed about it. Even though you might take home more money than the one who work inside, you know. But, you know, there is an inside outside. So if you have an outside bathroom, it means that your house is not properly built. Right? If you have an outside kitchen, it's worse. Right? So, so we have an inside outside thing. Well, teach your children the value of hard work. Anybody will write you now, and especially like all my name get called every minute. People think I have money. So they, they don't lack imagination. A, a friend tell me that, um, Teddy Jones tell me that he's, um, he's somebody made him godparents. And somebody think, because God bless your godparents, have money. So he said, his goddaughter wrote him and said, that she wants for Christmas a tablet. The only tablet him can buy is like half an hour or something like that. <laughs> it's better, however, to teach your children to make um Muffins, that's only like high, high something, and sell it. Or lemonade. So that they begin to create a sense of industriousness. Teach them to value hard work. We have this thing that you can just sleep in your bed and get to China. You have to get up and come out. You have to save for the fear. Then you have to book your ticket. Plan your hotel. You have to do something. So give your children the idea that the world does not exist for them. That they're going to just get up and snap them finger and things fall into place. Teach them to work hard and to value hard work. You know that my favorite little Bible verse is David. When the man offer him um, the threshing floor of own and the Jebusite to build the temple. And he said, man, me are your brethren, take it and go on. And David said, I am going to pay you for it. For I will not offer to the Lord sacrifices of that which costs me nothing. So, teach them to work hard and to value hard work. And finally, teach them the way of the Lord. Teach them the way of the Lord. When your child comes into a saving knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that child will have an organic growth. The growth will take place from the inside and they will surprise your best 
expectation. So, to make the difference, bringing up a generation, we must be humble. Well intentioned is not enough. We can make dreadful mistakes with our children. And those mistakes are costly. Costly. Be deliberate. Seek to forge in your children a thankfulness, a love of big ideas, a dreamer of the possibility. Give them a sense of hard work. And above all, teach them the way of the Lord. What is the closing point? It is that we need God's help. The Minister of National Security said that, and then he'll kill him with lick. <laughs> I am saying that without any demur. Right? I am happy that God in his goodness has blessed me with the opportunity of a father. I want the other opportunity and I've told him and I've told them but, and I've done everything I can. Right? But it doesn't happen. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You face, especially I just asked Stephen what the the fee, the fee is to come to Portmore Prep. And he tells me that it is cheaper than everywhere else, except for one place. But brother, if my father ever come back from the grave, I hear them numbers there. He would just go back in the grave. <laughs> it's harder than it used to be. And, and, and there, every day you live, you're making trade-off between doing a subject yourself so you can improve your earnings and spending more time with your children. You have an issue with your relationship, whether you should keep it from the children or talk it over with them. You have all kinds of issues. You have them. They want this, they want to go to America with your auntie, and you know if you're good, they're going to spoil her, and so on and so forth. And you have all of these issues. Where we must take this project is into the house of God. What did he say? Bring them up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. So there is a partnership with God. Not only is God the template of fatherhood, but he invites us into a project which is a partnership with God. To see to it that when we get a chance to play our role, our building, our preparing of our generation, we would have done well. So I want to challenge you, each one, to make the matter of your duty, your part, your role in fostering a generation of leaders and change agents, a, a generation more able to cope and to live and to challenge and to overcome the realities than we have been. I am saying, lean heavily on the Lord. Say like Moses, the eternal God is my dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. Mothers, do not aggravate your children. Teachers, do not aggravate your children. Parents all, all of us, don't embitter the children by how we relate to them. But instead, let us together engage in a project to morally, spiritually arm them, form them, see to their development. Precept and example are our method. God is our source. Remember, to be well-meaning is not enough. But we need to be deliberate and above all, to rely on God's help. May God richly bless you. Amen. Amen. 
I'm certain that we are all thankful for the words that God by His Holy Spirit has laid upon Reverend Roper's heart. And we thank Him for being obedient to the Spirit. We also thank Him for His graciousness in the comments that he has made, and on that basis we might say 2018, but he's not hearing me. But we want to give God thanks. We're not yet finished uh, with our service, and we want to spare a little time to just reflect on the words that we have heard, and just to reflect on where we are. I know we have a lot of parents here this morning, and... The word comes to us that we need God's help. We need God's help as we seek to nurture our children, to train them, and to recognize that we cannot do it on our own. As a matter of fact, uh, he has mentioned some things to us how we should teach our children, and above all, to teach them the way of the Lord. And the fact is that we need God's help in bringing up our children. Perhaps there are those here this morning, you're a parent or your parents here present, and you are having challenges and you're recognizing your own circumstances, and you want God's help to bring up your child. We're going to sing a song of reflection. I must have the Savior with me, for I dare not walk alone. And we're going to invite those who need a special prayer. And I tell you, when our children get to grade 5 and grade 6 and then head over into high school and those teenage years, we need the Savior with us. We need His hand to help us. And we want to pray a special prayer for parents this morning as we seek God's intervention and as we have heard it's not a bad thing it's a good thing as we sing that song let's those of us who want God's guidance to stand and we're going to offer a special prayer I must have the Savior with me for I dare not go alone. I must feel His presence near me and His arm around me thrown. Then my soul shall fare no ill. Let Him Steps follow still. Are there other parents that want to stand? I must have the Savior with me, for my faith at best is weak. He can whisper words of comfort that no can speak, then my soul shall bear no ill. Let him lead me where he will. I will go without a murmur, and his footsteps follow.
Now may we look to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you have left with us a manual that can help to guide us so that we can bring our children up in the way they should go. Thank you for entrusting children in our care. Thank you that as a church here, you gave us the vision to reach out to children. And we thank you for the wonderful partnership we share in community with persons who have committed their lives to serve with us. We thank you, O oh God, for what you have enabled us to do. But we bow today in confession to you, for we cannot all say we've done it well. We failed, Lord. We faltered along the way, but we're grateful for what is corrective and instructive that in our own reflection now we realize our inability to do it alone but we thank you that your servant has reminded us that we're not just partners here on earth we're grateful for partnership but Lord we need you and so like the songwriter we need you we need your help we need, we need you to help us to arm our children to form our children to be deliberate to be intentional as we seek to reach them, teach them, shape them. Oh God, as we seek to bring back the society from where it has gone. Oh God, you've been our help in ages past. You've been our hope for years to come you've been our shelter from the stormy blast we're living in a changing world oh god there are so many things that have frightened us there are so many things now that make us wonder what are we going to do how are we going to do it so many things that are impacting, influencing, captivating the interests of our young people. But we thank you, O oh God, that with you in the vessel we can smile at the storms. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to guide them in their thinking and to lead them in the way of the Lord to lead them to be industrious, to lead them to rise above the tide, to rise above fallen behavior and worthlessness. Lord, we believe we can because you have not given up on us. You've promised to be with us, never to leave us nor to forsake us. And for that reason, Lord, we come now in particular For those who are standing, indicating their need of you. Here we are standing in faith. There are some that have children biologically. There are some who have adopted children and some are guardians, I believe. 
but Lord we sense the awesome responsibility that we have especially as we listen to the instruction from your word amplified carefully exegeted how we should not provoke our children unto wrath but to ensure that we do as the Lord has commanded you know the needs in all the homes represented here now the person standing upstairs and downstairs and on the platform and perhaps on the outside Heavenly Father we pledge today to give ourselves to the wisdom of the word to the aid of the Holy Spirit to partner with others and thank you that no man is an island and no man stands alone we're for each other and we're for the Lord and Lord thank you that we can come in solidarity one with the other and I now cry on behalf of each one standing beseech you O oh God you know what we're going through for some it is with young children for some with aged children oh God for some it is that they're left alone to struggle they need partnership there's been unfaithfulness in the union unfaithfulness in the relationships But Lord, we are so thankful that no matter what the situations are, you come into the life of human interest. And when we have interruptions or disruptions, you're a God who specializes in the impossible. And you're a God who can manifest forth your glory and your power. And so God of heaven, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God of our four parents, God who has wrought the miracles down through the ages and have seen some of us come from the worst and have become blessings in your sight. Thank you that that is possible even today. That though there are hearts here panting and persons are here wondering how they will navigate their way and how they'll do it, perhaps financially, oh God. Emotionally, persons are, have been tortured, broken, psychologically. Um, oh God, there are those defects and we come to you acknowledging Heavenly Father that nothing is impossible with you some may be teachers standing who have this awesome responsibility to take up some children in fallen behavior to take up some children who are coming from homes that there's an absence of fathers or perhaps the absence of mothers from homes where we do not have good examples from homes that have failed oh God thank you for equipping them and thank you for vision and thank you for wisdom and knowledge and understanding and thank you heavenly father that there are so many who have pledged to work with children the underprivileged 
Oh God, the disadvantaged children who've been shortchanged in life. Thank you for their sacrifice, God, and the will to continue to work with. There's some who have, as it were, hit rock bottom, oh God. They, they, they sense the patience level has been running out. God, thank you for patience. We heard about that in the message too. How we need to be patient. Thank you that those who wait upon the Lord and renew their strength, they can mount up with wings like eagles, run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Teach us, Lord. Teach us how to wait. Teach us patience. And that's why we're standing, Lord. And that's why we're calling out to you. And that's why we're seeking you. We need your help, Lord, in so many different ways. We need your help, God. Thank you that that is guaranteed as long as we keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, may keep us people of faith, looking to the God of heaven who promises to be there in the thick and the thin with us. And so, Lord, thank you for just speaking to our hearts. Thank you for this Founders Day celebration. Thank you for guiding our thoughts. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for renewing our strength. And thank you for what you're going to do as we chant the way forward along life's corridors. And now we present the rest of the service into your care. Guide us, Heavenly Father, and send us forth from here in the power of your Spirit. Committed to do exploits for you. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. We will continue in our service as the ushers will wait on us for the morning's tithes and offering. And for those of you who are visiting with us, we take a walk up offering. Uh, also which goes towards missions and we will be doing that also this morning so we ask that you give generously and give cheerfully as we sing all things bright and beautiful all creatures great and small all things wise and wonderful the Lord God made them all <clears throat> All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings, he made their glowing colors, He made their tiny wings. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. All things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The purple-headed mountains, the river running by, the sunset and the morning that brightens up the sky. Reach. 
creatures great and small, all things wide and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. The tall trees in the green wood. The tall trees in the green wood. The meadows where we Together every day, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. He gave us, He gave us eyes to see. How great is God Almighty, who has made all things well. Let's stand together. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things white and wonderful, the Lord God made. Amen. I'm going to ask the musicians to continue playing while we lift the walk up offering. Getting closer to the end of our service, but we have some important matters to accomplish before we do so. Just to add to some of the recognition and announcements, um, it's really good to see that even after years of um, not so much having children here, we still have some of our past uh, PTA presidents with us. And I speak of Ms. Calder, who is here. Ms. Calder, please stand. Years ago, but she's still, she still comes back every year. And then Mr. Prince, who is the immediate past uh, president. Um, it seems like there is a correlation between head boy, head girl, and PTA presidents. I don't know. So if you want your child to be a head boy, a head girl, then you have to vie for the position because Mr. Prince's son was also the head boy. And now Mrs. Mullings Arnold, daughter is the head girl. 
All right. Um, so I just want to recognize those persons. Also, uh, from the church side, uh, some weeks ago, um, our young brother, Alio Graham, was um, caught up in an incident of, of shooting, and uh, he was shot and was hospitalized. He's out now. Um, he's here with us, not yet um, walking, but um, it's really great to see Alio. Um, can you just wave again, Alio? Right? That's Alio over there. And we continue to pray for Alio. That's his mother there, um, Sister Monica. And um, just keep on praying for this family. And we really are praying for God to really touch um, uh, in such a way that he will rise up out of that chair. In the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, understand also that Sister Mabel Wright is here with us. Oh, I'm just now seeing her. Sister Mabel. Yes. Amen. And I understand Sister Blackwood. Um, Sister Blackwood, where are you? Right. Okay, right. Sister Blackwood um, was away for a little also. Uh, want to also say that there will be a special uh, meeting of all the tertiary students, all the tertiary students from this church and from other churches in the association at, um, on Saturday. Oh, 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 yes. Right. There is a special event on Saturday and for all the tertiary students. And we're going to ask... Um, you to meet with Sister Zuri Scott right after church um, to hear more about that. So all the tertiary students meet with Sister Zuri right after church. And also um, council members who will be partaking in the event immediately following the service, I ask that you meet uh, here for further instructions immediately after the service. Pastors already mentioned that we close down for this week and we will be joining in with the Kingston Keswick. Uh, they, they, start, they, are, they will be at, it will be held at the Boulevard Baptist Church, seven o'clock each evening. There are also some midday meditations. So if you are in Kingston, your work in Kingston, then you can uh, make your way to uh, the Bethel Baptist Church, the Jamaica Theological Seminary, Kingston Parish Church, uh, for the midday meditations, and also Mona Baptist Church. So if you work in these, these and Webster Memorial, if you work close to these areas, then you can join the different speakers for the midday meditation for the Kis Kingston Keswick. And uh, we meet nightly at 7 o'clock at the Boulevard Baptist Church. The speaker is Dr. Wood Rudwell Kroll, uh, formerly of Back to the Bible. Uh, many of us used to listen to him back then, and he is here with us in Jamaica for the Kingston Keswick. He promises to be a very great week, and let us see how best we can be a part of that. The youth ministry uh, will be meeting here on Friday night, uh, to be transported there uh, for the special youth night. All right. Uh, there's, there's another announcement for the annual general meeting of the members of this church. It's two Saturdays from now, uh, the 1st of February at 4.30, and we ask that all uh, of us make every effort to be present. Uh, the finance committee, uh, we would... Although we are closing down for the week, I'm asking that we have a very critical meeting on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. So the Finance Committee, I'm asking for this meeting on Thursday. All right. Um, and also the directors of the different ministries, please send in your budget items so that it can be included in the budget for the annual general meeting. 
it's always good to recognize those who have served us well and as we indicated part of our celebration this morning is about one such person and that is uh, sister Cynthia Williams uh, who has served us so well in the prep school uh, did we recognize your, your two brothers his two brothers right I don't know if we had recognized you earlier on but welcome and um, they're here to support her uh, sister Williams uh, have served us through a critical period of our prep school and um, over the 15 years there were many accolades that were poured on our prep school and they continue to be poured on our prep school and I think that's part of the reason why uh, Ms. Calda is here this morning because she served as PTA president under the leadership of uh, uh, Sister Cynthia and there are others who are here uh, specifically on that basis and we want to invite her now to come forward and we have Dr. Jean Small, uh, a consultant with the prep school and also uh, uh, one of our uh, teachers in the prep school who served during that time also and um, she's going to come and read a citation to Mrs. Williams. Let's give them a hand as they come. Elder Stephen Rooms, Mrs. Etta Walker, our special guest and honoree, Mrs. Cynthia Williams, members of the church community, parents, all members of the staff of Portmore Missionary Prep School, good morning. I want to thank Mrs. Etta Walker for inviting me to come and read the citation this morning. Being here has given me the opportunity to hear Reverend Dr. Garnet Roper once again. I always like to hear him speak. I think he's one of the most brilliant preachers and he's so down to earth. I hope this morning's sermon has been videoed or at least recorded, I think the whole nation should hear what he had to say this morning. But it's a pleasure and a distinct privilege for me to read this citation. I worked with Mrs. Williams, as it was said, and she, I experienced her innovative mind as she had asked me to teach French to the GSAT students to give them that experience before they go to high school. And so I'm very, very happy to be here once again, to be with her and to read this citation for Mrs. Cynthia Williams, BSc, MA, MS. The blue of the indigo is not a color that is easily removed. Its indelible quality is long lasting and unforgettable. Such is the memory that lives on of Mrs. Cynthia Williams's 15 years as principal of the Portmore Missionary Preparatory School. From a background of varying experiences as teacher at a government school in Olympic Gardens, 
to working in the private sector and subsequently conducting her own business, she came to Portmore Missionary Preparatory School in 1996 as a grade four teacher, bringing with her the training she received as an educator at St. Joseph's Teachers College. From the very beginning, her passion and her joy colored her devotion to helping struggling children achieve and be successful, especially the boys who always seem to be lagging behind the girls. She sought to qualify herself for this task with a BSc in education from the Western Carolina University, an MA in interdisciplinary studies with an emphasis on counseling psychology from the Caribbean Graduate School of Theology, and a master's degree in special education from the Nova Southeastern University. As soon as a vacancy was available for the position of principal, she applied and was appointed in 1999. As the first guidance counselor at the Portmore Missionary Preparatory School, Mrs. Williams has left a die on the lives of both children and teachers under her administration. She is remembered for her integrity, impartiality, and exemplary teamwork with the staff. In recognition of her vision for the school, the board gave her a free hand in running the school which had the positive result of raising the overall quality of education offered at this institution. It was therefore not surprising that she became an elected member of the Jamaica Independent Schools Association, as well as an elected committee member of the St. Catherine Principals Cluster. Her relocation to the United States of America in 2001, though regretted by all who worked with her, allowed her to complete her professional studies at the Mellie K. Parker Elementary School. As an educator, her life and her constant concern and care for children is guided by the words of Henry Adams who said, and I quote, a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. End of quote. Leaders, statesmen, teachers, parents, and caregivers come from all walks of life. But on this day, January 19, 2014, the Portmore Missionary Preparatory School is proud to honor the courage, the vision, and the contribution that former principal Mrs. Cynthia Williams has made to the development of this school as a leading educational institution in Jamaica. On behalf of the Portmore Missionary Prep family, we would like to present we would like to present this this token of your of our appreciation 
for your hard work and dedication to this noble institution. You have been a perfect role model to everyone, and your love shall always be in our hearts. All right, Mrs. Williams, I have been with her. Well, I had her, the privilege of being a parent her for, with her for nine years. Six years with, the, uh, with my son and three years with my daughter. Mrs. Williams, we really appreciate you. And we could not allow this opportunity to go by without presenting this lovely token to you on behalf of the PTA. But I'm not going to do it alone. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask my previous PTA president, to join me up here. <laughs> so on behalf of the PTA, we present this lovely token to Mrs. Cynthia Williams. Wow, I am overwhelmed. Worship leader, Elder Stephen Rooms, and board chairman, Kenton Bryan, vice chairman, Reverend Spencer Cahoon, Reverend Dr. Garnett Roper, although he's not here, Dr. Margaret Barnett, administrator, Mrs. Etta Walker, principal, Mrs. Arnold, PTA president, staff members of PMP Portmore Missionary Prep School, students, parents, well-wishers, good morning. good morning. It is so good to see everybody. And um, I came in yesterday morning from the United States at 6 a.m. And um, my wonderful brother, brothers, will you please stand? My brother, Littleton, he was at the airport to meet me. And then he called my other brother, that's my youngest brother, Morris. And he called him and he said, Miss Willie's on her way, get the breakfast ready. <laughs> and by the time I got there, wow, breakfast was ready. And I'm telling you, I have not seen my house yet since I came. Because that's where I am, I'm treated like a queen. Thank you, brothers. I really appreciate it. Um, as I was thinking about all the things that happened here, I remembered one September morning, school had just started, and I had this little boy who was not doing very well academically. As a matter of, fla uh, matter of fact, he was a slow learner. So I wanted to, I didn't know exactly what to do with him on that morning. So I said to one of the grade one teachers, hold this little boy for me until I sort out myself. I don't know what I'm going to do with him. Here another little one from the class, kill him with lick. <laughs> and I heard Pastor Roper mentioning the same thing. The little boy just turned around. I said, what am I going to do with this little boy? The other one said, kill him with lick. Then there was another situation. A teacher in an um, intermediate class, five-year-olds, 
and the teacher was there getting all involved. I think she was teaching some song or something. I don't know what she was doing, but she was there jumping up. And you know, when you're with little kids, you have to be involved. So this teacher was there jumping up and going on. And one little boy said, a teacher breast me, I watch all them, I jump up, jump up. I am telling you, it's a wonderful thing to be in school. Can you imagine? It was good. It was wonderful. I came here as a regular classroom teacher in 1996. And when I came here, I was given a grade four class. And I had the opportunity of teaching some of the most brilliant, the most disciplined students that have walked the corridors of Portmore Missionary Prep School. It was a great opportunity. We had fun, and the children learned well. I remember one little girl in my class, one day I asked them to write a composition. And I said, write a composition about your new class, because they were just being promoted from grade three to grade four. And this little girl wrote her composition and she said, I like my class, I like my teacher, I like my friends, but I don't like my teacher's shoes. <laughs> and I tell you something, that shoes went into early retirement. <laughs> and you know that little girl went to the States and she brought back a pair of shoes for me. It was a little big, but I was grateful for it. <laughs> I am telling you. I have been all over. Um, before I came here, I gave 15 years with the Ministry of Education. Then I went into private sector, and I worked there for a while. I opened my own business in Yala St. Thomas, and I was there for a while, but you know, we always say the grass is green on, on the other side until we get the water bill. But um, it was good. I reaped good success, and I'm really happy for my life. But while I was there doing all of these things, my heart was tugging for the classroom. Always wanted to be in the classroom. So I decided to come back to the classroom and give service, and I have no regrets so far. Um, I had some of, uh, where am I? In 1999, there was a vacancy for principal. I applied for the position, did the interview, and was successful. I was a bit timid and a little overwhelmed about being in the pilot seat. But then I remember Dr. Barnett, who said, turn your face like flint, and that is taken from um, Isaiah. And that helped to diminish the fears. And Dr. Barnett was with me throughout the entire time I was at Portmore Missionary, especially um, for the 12 years that I was principal. She was the wing beneath my wing. We shared ideas, she gave me good advice, and together we worked together as a beautiful team. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. I really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. You wouldn't understand. Words are just not enough to say thanks. And then, a little after we started out, um, Reverend Bar um, Garnet Roper decided that he wanted to change the face of this place. And so we got a wonderful structure, as you can see over there, and that was when we started to flow. So he gave us this beautiful structure, and we started working hard. Um, I inherited a well-established school. School was here when I came, 
well established, well known. And it had made its name. So the seed was planted, the watering had begun, and God was given the increase. We continued the work by tackling the Goliath in our school. And you know what that Goliath was? Illiteracy. That was the big Goliath. And if you can kill that Goliath, then your school can make the progress that it ought to make. And so we put teachers in place, and we worked at that thing. I remember Mrs. McLean. I remember Mrs. Michael and many others who worked so hard with those children. And soon after, we had eradicated illiteracy. All our children are reading 100%. And we want to thank those teachers for doing such a good job. Our grade four literacy speaks for itself. We watered the seed in spelling bee. God gave us the increase. And for six consecutive years, we held the parish championship in spelling bee. And three of our students went on to represent Jamaica in the Scripps Award. And I tell you something, Arden got a part of the glory, but we claim Alicia and Trudy because before they went to Arden, they were already parish finals. So we claim them, they're ours, and they represented Jamaica at the Scripps Howard in the Spelling Bee competition, and they did well. Trudy was in third position. And then if that was not enough, God gave us our own, our little Cornell Gray. And he did everything right here, and he went on to the Scripps Award and represented the school. I want to thank Reverend Archer, who helped us, um, the late um, Hazel um, Reed, uh, Miss Heron, and um, Mrs. Kane Elliott, who is now doing it. Um, we thank you so very much. You kept on watering. So you see all these years we're here, all we were doing was just watering. So everybody had a watering can and we were just watering. That's all we were doing. We watered the seed in the area of technology. This was one of the first school, one of the very first school to set up a computer lab. And we exposed our students from the three-year-old straight up to grade six. All our children are computer literate. We are trailblazers. Thanks to all the computer teachers. Ms. Spirit is a present computer teacher. Thank you so very much. We watered in the area of the academics and God gave us the increase. Our students showed mastery in every national exams set by the Ministry of Education. And by the time they got to grade six, they continued to do well. Our children mastered every aspect. And I tell you what, our boys were never lagging. Our boys were on par with the girls all throughout school life, and we were happy for that because I paid keen attention to the boys. I wanted to make sure that activities were here for the boys to do because the girls were in everything and most times the girls were left behind. So I made it a point of my duty. And when I heard Pastor Roper's speech, this, um, his thing this morning, I said, my God, look at that. We watered the seed in our boys' lives, and they did exceptionally well. And we give all the glory to God. We didn't do anything. All we did was to just water. 
we watered in table tennis. And for four consecutive years, we were the champion. I thank Mr. Richard who watered that seed. And so we were all on television. We were everywhere doing good. God gave us the increase. And we watered in so many areas. I am telling you, it has been a long time. So many things have happened over these 15 years that I started to write this thing and it was, I just couldn't get to the end of it. And I'm saying, what is happening? And right now, I am not even using what I wrote down. I'm speaking from the heart because I know, that I know exactly what happened during that time. I remember in our sports department, Miss Angela Williams and Miss Burton and Miss Scoot and forgive me, Miss Scoot is now Mrs. Brown. I'm sorry, forgive me. Um, we watered. I remember that walkathon we had from Elsha all the way down to school. I remember the walkie days. I remember the funny socks days, the funny hat days. Oh my God, I remember we had a mascot one, one year. All of these things were so good, made school fun. The children enjoyed it. We played together and we worked together. So good. I remember Miss Williams, Angela Williams. She would sit in that little classroom over there and she would prepare the, the, the netballers' um, gears. And she would go to town and she would do the shopping for all the fundraising efforts that we were having. We would walk downtown and buy footwear for the netballers. Oh my God, we watered. Miss Williams, you watered. You did so much. All the little things that many people never wanted to do. You did. You did. You cooked. You did all of these things. They might seem small, but they are great things. Great things. Mrs. Dawkins Blake, I remember in art and craft, when we were going down to the institute, with all those pieces, God gave us the increase. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Clark, she watered the seed. I remember those little brownies dressed up in their little brown uniform, going all around the place, doing good things. Mrs. Clark, you watered. I remember well. I remember. Mrs. Power, I don't know if she's here today. Mrs. Power, you were one of my number one. You watered in the area of... I remember Mrs. Wa Mrs. Um, Power was the first person who started the quiz, the quiz competition. She was the first person who started it. And the first scholarship we got from the grade six class came from Mrs. Power's class. First scholarship came from Mrs. Power's class. And from then the trend has continued. Mrs. Harris has taken it on. How many scholarships so far, Mrs. Harris? Four in all? You sure is four? No, four for you. Give me the total. Five. Five scholarships so far. Bless God. God has given us the increase in everything we did, in football, in karate, in, oh my God, we were so blessed. We were so blessed. And we give all the glory to God. If I have left, whoa, I could not forget Miss Daly. I'm telling you, that dancing thing, wow. We need a new trophy case because what we have there you know, it's not enough. As a matter of fact, it was my intention to um, get a little room and call it the Hall of Fame. That's what I wanted. Because a little case cannot hold all the trophies and all the things that we have acquired over the years. I thank you very much. So God gave us the best team of teachers. Everybody did their little thing. Everybody. And everybody showed me respect. I am happy for that. I am happy for that. Although I was accused of 
being on the parent side and on the student side. I was accused of that. But I don't think I was on any side. I was on the side of justice. Because I think that parents needed a voice, the students need a voice, and the teachers, you too, need your voice. So it was just justice. If somebody had a complaint, we had to investigate, and we had to make sure that we did what we had to do. Everything was great. God is such a good God that we can't beat our chest and say we didn't do anything. Everything goes to God Almighty. To crown off all of that, I want to thank Sister Pansy. Always remembering the school in our prayers. I remember those Wednesdays when we had fasting. Sister Pansy and her team were always here. And you prayed us up. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And then my friend over here, she was a past parent herself, Mrs. Drisdale. God spoke to her specially. Mrs. Drisdale, you understand? And told her that she should, rem she should pray with me. And for over five years, we prayed on the phone. Every morning before we did anything else, we prayed. Thank you, Mrs. Drisdale. Thank you. We prayed. And we prayed with the children too. We fed them with the word of God. Because when I discovered that all of these, you know, these artists were going on with all these kind of things, these kind of lyrics, and our children were just soaking up these things, Holy Spirit said to me, no, feed them with the word of God. So every morning, we would get a, word, a verse of scripture, and we would repeat it. We would have our regular prayers and our devotion. And I am telling you, God has given us the increase. So we are happy today, and he continues to give the increase. So whether I'm here or I'm, or I'm not here, the increase continues. And when, we when it comes for... When it's time for Mrs. Walker to go, God will still give the increase. Because once he starts something, he's going to continue it. And so we give him all the praise and all the glory. We don't take anything for ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, parents, brothers and sisters, I really thank you for everything you did to assist us and to help us along the way. God has been good to us. People might ask me, oh, Mrs. Williams, what's your legacy? To be honest with you, I don't even know. I don't know what the legacy is because I never taught grade six. I never played table tennis. I didn't do any of these things. But if I gave a word of encouragement to one person, if I prayed for one person, if I was kind to one person, if I loved even one person, that should be my legacy. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you, Sister Cynthia. And, um, you know, it's such a wonderful thing that at the end of, and it's really not the end, but it's her tenure at Portmore Missionary Prep, um, that you can come back and say all these things and just recognize that it's really greater than just Mrs. Williams but God by his Holy Spirit at work in your life and enabling you to do what you have done. Oh, she, she wants to say one more thing. 
<laughs> I, st I stand here to stand. You might be wondering what I'm doing in the United States. Um, I want to tell you that I really love the United States. I'm loving it. With, uh, with, with all the cold and the everything, I love it. You know why I love it? You can be flexible. You can do anything you want to do. You are not restricted. I'm telling you, one day I was at home, and my neighbor called me, and she said, they called me Miss Cynthia. I said, Miss Cynthia, I know somebody that wants his house to be tidied up. You think you can do it? I said, yes, man. <laughs> I said, yes. And I live in Akinsak, and I had to take two buses to go over to Englewood, and I cleaned that house. And for one hour every day, one hour, and at the end of six weeks, I ended up with 1,990 dollars. I am telling you, clean house. I have been sweeping my house here for so many years and nobody ever pay me a dime. <laughs> and I go to America and sweep somebody's house and look at that. Look at that. Can you believe it? I take care of children in the afternoons because it's a serious thing with children up there. People need to go to work and they have their children, they don't know what to do with them. So I have about six of them that I watch in the afternoons. So I just stay home and the parents bring them to the door and I receive them and I watch them. And then when six o'clock come, they come for them. I get a little money. <laughs> Tell them money. I don't have to play in the bus fair, I don't go anywhere. Stay right in my house. Stay right in my house. I am also a Mary Kay beauty consultant. So, home base again, because the money can come in. You don't have to be sitting in the office to get the money. And so I love America. I love America. I'm still working with children, helping them to read, showing them this. Oh my God, they love me so much. One parent called me and she said, oh, Mrs. Miss India, your heart is of gold. I said, really? Because right now I can't stay because I have to leave here by Tuesday. Because if I stay later, parents can't go to work. They're waiting on me to watch their kids. Amen. And on top of that, I am writing a book. Amen. And um, I hope to complete it in this year. So that's what America gives. You can do anything. It's not like Jamaica if you're not wearing tie and you're not wearing your jacket and you're not doing anything. You do anything. You do anything. All of these are home base. So I don't have to go anywhere. So all the cold and you hear people talking about, I am inside, warm. Amen. Amen. I hope you're paying attention to the notice. Um, there are some notices up there that you need to pay attention to. Um, some persons may be blocking and um, you need to remove your vehicle. Just to make mention before our final item uh, that the, this, the, 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 um, the sermon by Reverend Ropo is available upstairs uh, for a cost of $150 um, on CD. So if you are interested, you can go right upstairs and get your copy at a cost of $150. The school choir is here with us. It's always wonderful to hear them. And we have left that for the last because we wanted the parents to stay with us. All right? So they are going to come now and sing a song and dedicate it to their parents and also to um, the, 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 the honoree and to the rest of the staff. We're going to invite the school choir to come at this point. Thank you. 
Let's clap them some more. That was indeed great singing. And I think it really blends in with the theme that we have been carrying throughout the service. Parents need to call on Jesus. Yes. Amen? Yes. We can't do it without him. And none of us, whether we are parents or no parents or grandparents or whatever kind of parents, we must continue to call on Jesus. Amen? And we want to thank the prep school choir for that lovely rendition. And it has really resonated and we give God thanks for it. Uh, there's just one final thing that I forgot to mention. Church family news again. Just a card from Steve and Desreen Cole. No words, are, no words are sufficient to express our appreciation for the love and support you have shown to us through our difficult time. Very special thank you, and with it, you will find sincere appreciation because you are so kind. Thank you. And you know the, their story, and we continue to pray for this couple. We have had a wonderful day, and just want to thank you so much for worshiping with us uh, here this morning. It's still morning, and we're happy for that. And we continue to open the invitation for those who don't normally come and you don't have a church going on a Sunday morning. You and your children come to church. Amen? And I'm not going to say send your children to church. You and your children come to church. Amen? I don't know if we had asked Miss Williams to stand earlier on. But I want to ask Miss Angie to stand. Longest serving member of staff, 25 years, Portmore Missionary Prep School. Amen. Thank you for your service to the school. Amen. We're going to stand. And I'm going to ask Pastor to come and pronounce the benediction as we close the service. Let's stand together, shall we? Let's just lift our right hands. And now may the grace of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the true fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. May he rest, remain, and abide with us all. And may God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Almighty lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please allow the platform party to recess before you.